We shoot the new. New speakers get the option of having a shot, and uh, we're going to do that right now for Thomas Jang. Could we please thank him for giving his first talk at DEF CON? All right, it's, 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 a bit, it's a bit late to be worrying about drunk doing your talk. Can we flip the slides on? Thank you. So, for a long time. Would you like uh, some? Fuck it. <laughs> to our fallen brethren Kaminsky, Rober, Tuna, Middick, everybody who we've lost, their family. We love you. To them. All right. So damned if you do. The risks of pointing the emperor is buck naked. Uh, other than, you know, seeing the emperor's dingus. Uh, legal stuff. Opinions are expressed for our own. Please don't sue us. We do not represent employers in any way. Uh, do not pet, eat, or taunt the super happy fun ball. Uh, yeah, you probably know who I am. Uh, every DC since seven, uh, except the play years. I think I'm at like eight or nine talks. I, I, I measure badges by the pound. Uh, black badge holder, three time hacker Jeopardy, Pope of the Church of Wi Fi, hacker of sex toys, hero to some, pain in the ass to most. Yeah, I'm way shorter than Renner, so I'm gonna lower this way down here. Uh, but I'm Thomas. Um, I'm mostly here for the politician jokes. I'm a recovering politician, I promise. Uh, it's my second DEF CON. I was uh, 28. That's my first one post safe mode. Um, first time I'm talking, as you saw. I currently work as a security architect for a subnational government in Canada. And I once did a thing with the government, which is most leading to this talk. Uh, I'm here for the vibes. My goal is to not be so hungover that I sleep through any of the talks. Um, and here's a very serious picture <laughs> that looks like I belong at uh, Black Hat, not DEF CON. Uh, I definitely uh, don't represent my employer here. My views are going to be my own. So, uh, yeah, I think my director's in the audience somewhere. So, uh, definitely don't speak on behalf of them. So, why are we here? So, there's this whole mentality of, you know, if you see something, say something, you know, after 9 11. But hackers are going to hack, and generally we do so to try to make things better. Uh, pointing out problems in systems nowadays is extraordinarily perilous and way more than it needs to be. Uh, we've both had run-ins with these issues with our local government, and you know, here's me, you know, well-known researcher and a actual like elected politician, and we still run afoul of these things. There's a problem here. Uh, we are Canadian, so sorry, uh, but this applies to like most countries and jurisdictions. Um, so let's, let's learn from some mistakes, uh, fix the legislation and policies, and hopefully we can now get back to like, the bigger problems we actually need to be solving. So why do I care about things like this? So I was employed at a bank called ATB Financial in Alberta, a uh, senior security analyst, kind of a dream job. I got to say, you know, I hack banks for a living, and in the evenings I hack sex toys. Like, who gets to say that? Uh, September 2018, at our local B-Sides, I gave a talk basically about why we can't have nice things. Uh, the, day, uh, the first day of the conference, the CISO for Service Alberta gets up there uh, on a panel and says, oh yeah, we scan our stuff all the time and are constantly patching. Well, I'm in the audience, I get on a showdown on my phone, I'm like, uh, no you don't. So I put some of this into my slides. Uh, for my talk the next day. You know, I gave him a heads up saying, hey, this is, I'm gonna do this, are you okay with this? He's like, sure. Um, threw this stuff into my, my slides last minute. Uh, there was open printers, you know, where you could see the logs of what had been printed and emailed. Uh, end of life servers, servers 10 years behind on patching. Um, sent them the data immediately afterwards. Thought all was well. You know, met, uh, met with him a week later for lunch. You know, he's like, "Oh yeah, that was cool. You know, you know, you ruffled some feathers, but it's all good. Well, all was well." But ATB Financial is what we call a crown corporation, so it's technically owned by the government. It's run like a regular corporation, but the government still has some some hooks in there. It's supposed to be arm's length, but that's a, apparently a very short arm. 
Uh, Service Alberta, the department, owned the government of Alberta's IP address space, but they basically handed out addresses like an ISP. Uh, they would hand them out to other ministries or agencies. They had absolutely no oversight or control over what they did with them. There was no central policies for security or anything like that. Um, this caused an absolute panic across the cha uh, chain of command at the government of Alberta that I was, had pointed out you know, that the emperor had no clothes. Uh, emails were sent, calls were made, meetings were held, and I suddenly found myself uh, without a job. Uh, they got me a code of conduct violation of causing embarrassment to the organization, which I find very humorous considering some of the other crap that I pulled that they didn't fire me over. Um, so yeah, they, they, they uh, suddenly gave me a lot of time on my hands, which is never a good idea, as my wife can attest. So I began to dig into the problem on Shodan further, more than I could just you know, do on my phone in the audience. Uh, 150 hosts, 3,200 vulnerabilities later, just from Shodan data and like you know, looking at server headers. Uh, F5 admin console, uh, login pages, publicly facing, uh, uh, debug interfaces, there was a LAN sweeper default install with click button to log in as administrator, you know, um, heaps of unpatched servers and end-of-life stuff. It was, it was like embarrassing to be from Alberta in this case. Uh, documented as much of this as I could with Shodan links, you know, saying, hey, this is all public. Uh, ethically and morally, I still felt I had to report this because my information's in these systems too and I'm legally obligated to put some of it in there. Uh, but there was no official reporting channel for government of Alberta systems because every ministry and everything like that was a silo and it wasn't apparent who owned what. Um, the buck stopped nowhere. Knocked on a lot of doors to get attention to the matter, handed over the data to a couple of different uh, uh, departments and agencies, but little or no action. Uh, I got the public interest commissioner involved uh, they're the ones that look for like fraud and, and graft and waste and stuff like that. Um, they didn't really take me seriously until I pointed out there was 70 vulnerabilities in their secure reporting website for whistleblowers. That got their attention. Uh, they leaned on the government to do something. Uh, they could, it was a case of either we have you stop everything and we do an investigation for six months or you acknowledge yes there's a problem and just work on, you know, solve this. Uh, finally got a paper letter from the Service Alberta CISO's office saying, you know, please report vulnerabilities to this email address and, you know, this is your point of contact, uh, which I very promptly did uh, in February 2019 and waited. Their publicly available policy said they will fix criticals in 30 days. Now, whether or not that policy was meant to be publicly available on that website, I don't think so. Uh, but 21 days uh, later, you know, we're a couple of weeks away from an election at the time, 21 days, they, they hadn't done anything. So I, I'm like, hey guys, uh, just so you know, uh, morally and ethically, I have no problems uh, uh, going public with this after 30 days. Well, they took that as a threat. And I mean, one can debate, you know, my judgment and my phrasing of, of things, you know, that, that's a whole other talk. but. Uh, they called the cops on me. <laughs> the, the city police, computer crimes investigators, you know, wanted to have a chat about threats I had been making. Uh, agreed finally to, to uh, be in a public coffee shop, you know, where there was cameras and, you know, of course, caffeine. I walked them through everything. Uh, they learned a bunch of stuff, because most of the stuff they deal with is, you know, my boyfriend hacked my Facebook account. Uh, walked them through everything. Uh, GOA never told, the government never told them that their policy was 30 days to fix this stuff. So they're like, oh, that changes the context dramatically. Uh, they were thanking me at the end because their information's in these computers too, uh, and they wanted to see it fixed too. So I, at the end of, of this you know, chat, I said, no one from the government has actually like, talked to me. You know, it's always been like these, these letters or this, this indirect communication. Just have somebody call me. Like, we can sort this out. Uh, and they did, they passed that along. Uh, CISO for Service Alberta, a uh, different person than I've been dealing with previously, uh, uh, had coffee with them, 
Uh, it turns out he was the guy who actually called the cops on me on their lawyer's advice because it was a case of, well, if we don't report this possibly as a threat and something happens, then like liabilities and like weird stuff. Uh, it's a good map. Uh, it's a tough position. You know, governments change, priorities change, budgets are thin. Um, explained a, uh, to me a lot of the systemic problems they've been seeing in this, the uh, IT infrastructure. Uh, the hatchet's buried, you know, fortunately not in anyone's head. But I, I still want to be part of the solution. Uh, so I'm trying to play nice, but I am a strategic pain in the ass. Uh, reminding them that they need to do things like vulnerability disclosure programs and you know have like a way to report these things and also to keep up on this stuff. I mean there was a lot of things here that, that were problematic uh, besides my choices uh, in phrasing and such. Lack of a vulnerability disclosure program, guidance, policy or official channels. Like there was nothing. Uh, whistleblower uh, statutes don't apply to the general public. You know, it's like if you are a mem uh, employed by that department, you have uh, the potential for whistleblower protections, but the public doesn't. Uh, there's anecdotal evidence and some documentation of, of ass covering where I had basically pointed out literally the emperor had no clothes, but instead of slinking back to the uh, palace in their shame, uh, yeah, they basically shot the kid, you know, that pointed this out. Uh, some exaggerated and untrue claims of breaching confidentiality because, like I said, all this was on Shodan, and I, I had the links I can show you. Uh, it's all behind me, better job, better life now. Um, but, you know, this was a, a thing that uh, uh, happened, and it's been stuck with me. So let's fast forward to this case in Mississippi. Some of you may have heard of this. October 2021, uh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch journalist Josh Renaud uh, found there was a, a website for looking up the licensing status for teachers. You know, you put the teacher's name in, it would say, you know, are they licensed, how long they've been, you know, whether they're active, etc. Well, if you actually looked at the response in, in the source for the HTML, their social security number was in there amongst other information, because it was pulling the full record and just the JavaScript was rendering just you know, the licensing status. Like, this is a brain-dead, simple uh, uh, vulnerability that, you know, he, he confirmed with a computer science professor saying, you know, is this a, as big a problem as I think? And it's like, hell yeah. Uh, the department, you know, reported it, held off on, on, you know, publishing anything until it was fixed. The Department of Education had decided, uh, was drafting a, uh, press release thanking him for you know, reporting this and, and getting it fixed and everything. But then the governor stepped in. Yeah, and I think this is a good part to talk about some things about politics, right? The governor claimed that the reporter was a hacker who was acting um, against the state agency and trying to compromise teachers' information. But, I mean, you all know that when you request something from a website, they send it back and it just like sits in your cache and they're sending you things you didn't even ask for, right? Like this is very much, I think, showing that like the hack was pressing F12, right? It was viewing the source, um, it was looking at the requests that were already coming back, things that were probably cached in proxy servers and cached in their web browsers and all those things. Um, that's not a hack in, in any sense, right? But the case was referred to prosecutors, right? So it was sent to uh, investigation, um, and five months later, lo and behold, surprise, no charges, no crimes. But the issue was that it's the governor's office that was responsible for this website in question. So it's something that we look at and we say, oh, it's funny on the surface, right? It's, it's, it's funny to think about somebody going after a reporter who hits F12. But five months of basically hell for somebody to have to be to, uh, have a lawyer and do all these things is something uh, really problematic. Uh, so let's talk about what happened with me. Um, it's September 2021, it feels like year 345 of the pandemic, even if it's only like day 345, but vaccines are rolling out uh, in, in most areas. They're, we're not out of the woods yet. People are getting their first dose-ish. Um, and in Alberta, the Premier Jason Kenney declares that it's the best summer ever. Uh, and he rolls back all COVID restrictions. 
Now, we know how that goes in most jurisdictions. It's not different in Alberta. Um, and by September, things are worse than ever. I'm an elected official at the time, and um, uh, the premier, Kenny, had stated that there would never be vaccine passports, right? Um, so instead, in the fall, they bring in the restrictions exemption program. So everyone still needs um, proof of vaccination, but in the REP, uh, if you do that, now you can go to things that you wouldn't be allowed to go to if you didn't have your proof of vaccination. So it's not a vaccine passport. It's just a pass that allows you into places if you have your vaccine. Um, but everybody needs this proof. The online health records portal that we have, um, that it already existed to display your health records was slammed and not working. So they needed to build a portal that could retrieve these vaccinations very, very quickly. Um, and that first release left a bit to be desired. Um, so it basically required three things to, to verify your, your information, right? It required your Alberta healthcare number, your AHN, um, your date of birth, and the month or year of any of your doses. And most people at that point had only had one dose. So the original site, when you put in your information, spat out this unsigned, unlocked PDF, uh, no way to verify, no QR code, nothing. Um, and people were on Twitter basically immediately putting any type of name, any type of vaccine that they received, whatever, all over the PDF because that's the only thing it was. It was just anybody could print it out. Uh, but looking deeper, there was some other problems. There was room for things like uh, maybe some sort of enumeration attack because date of birth and dose dates, if you do any OSINT on anybody, um, those are pretty easy. Most people are posting their uh, doses on social media at the time, right? They do those videos of them spinning their arm or whatever, right? Um, and there's only one thing that's unique here, and it happens to be a piece of PHI, right? It happens to be your Alberta healthcare number. Um, the Alberta healthcare number is, I think it's nine digits, but it has a tech digit as well, so that space is actually quite a bit smaller. Uh, and I received some concerns from an Albertan who, who knew that I had a computer science background and said, hey, like, I think this type of attack, this brute force enumeration, might be possible. Um, I decided to take a look. And I wrote a very simple script. I think uh, I described it to the cops as a high school level script. It was a little Python script. It had uh, some, the site had some IP based street limiting, but no other controls to speak of. Um, that's a pretty simple solution, right? You just pipe it through the Tor proxy you got running anyways. Um, and what I did is I decided, well, you have to minimize the impact, right? When you go and do this type of investigation, you don't want to uh, actually uh, have any type of PHI that could be dangerous leaked. So I tried to use uh, the premier's date of birth, which was public records on his Wikipedia page, uh, used a vaccination date, which, or month and, and year, which was on Twitter. Um, and, you know, many requests later, a couple days later, it got a hit. Um, script just ran by itself. Uh, wasn't him, point proven. So I reported it to one of our staff members. Um, had them figure out who to report it to officially, um, and I basically forgot about it. Within about a week or a week or two later, they quietly made the change, put in a CAPTCHA, put in some controls on, on things like uh, geofencing, and things seemed fine. Um, then comes December 2021. I'm, I'm away on a ski trip because uh, it's December and I want to go skiing. Uh, my sister's isolating. She's traveling home uh, to visit us and, in, in my house. and. The RCMP decide at like 6.30 or 5.30 in the morning, something like that, that they've got a search warrant they're going to raid my home. So uh, not a very happy sister um, when they're in your house trying to sleep at 6.30 in the morning and uh, the RCMP flash a badge at the door. Um, but I do have some very nice doorbell footage of police trying to serve a warrant on me. Um, and they were serving an investigation under the Health Information Act of the Borough HIA. Uh, which basically says no person shall knowingly gain or attempt to gain access to health information in contravention of the act. Attempt, attempt is going to be a key word here. Um, there's no wiggle room or, or anything or understanding for uh, good interest or uh, public interest in, in securing records and things like that. And it becomes a bit of a problem, obviously. Uh, hence why I'm here. <laughs> um, but um, we can note that, of course, the, the Health Information Act does uh, require custodians and affiliates of custodians of the information to take reasonable steps in accordance with the regs to maintain the technical, administrative, physical safeguards and protect against anticipated threats, right? So this is something that they should have anticipated. A reasonable person would say, like, yeah, this is a normal enumeration no issue. More. Yeah, like, there should be types of controls against this. Um, but basically it concludes after a year or so of investigation, going to court, lots of lawyer fees, 
um, no criminal charges, and, and I paid a $7,500 Canadian fine, uh, so like 5,000 American or something, um, for a breach of the Health Information Act, uh, which was that attempt to access records part. Uh, I did step out of my caucus, and uh, I didn't seek re-election when the election came around in May of 23, 2023. So, so what, are the, what are the problems that are existing here? Uh, you have governments advocating for people to report risks uh, that they see on one hand out of abundance of safety, they'd rather have a bunch of false alarms and rather than you know, potentially miss something. But they'll say, you know, uh, if you see something, say something, except for this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. Like, but they're not making that very clear. Uh, there's no proactive planning for not if, but when uh, someone comes to them with a report because you know, many eyes make bugs shallow. People will, will find things. Uh, lack of vulnerability disclosure pathways, no clear safe harbor, uh, you know, chilling effect from laws that have no exceptions to carve out. In Thomas's case, it's like if I ever found myself just purely by random looking at somebody else's health information, I'm like, nope, 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 nope. Like, I'm not gonna say a damn thing because I am, I access something that was I was not authorized to, therefore I'm in violation of the law, I'm screwed. Uh, there's no whistleblower attacks, uh, protections against the government retaliating against the public, strangely that. Uh, you know, in our case, there was no major oversight over uh, IT systems or accountability for the, the government systems. Uh, there was also problem, problems we've seen, uh, and partially with some of my behaviors, uh, lack of researchers understanding the laws and where these landmines are. You know, so somebody could be looking at things for perfectly legitimate reasons, but not realize the danger they're putting themselves in. You also run into the situations with governments of changes in leadership. You know, your parties change, uh, uh, your, your leadership changes, and it's like, oh, well, this thing that we had planned to do, uh, we're shelving that and going a different direction, which means we got to like start all over again. So nothing ever gets done. Uh, you lose institutional knowledge from those sort of things. You know, the attrition of, of employees. Reporting to companies is equally fraught, uh, and I've done a lot of this. If they have no vulnerability disclosure program, it is such a gray area. Uh, it's never clear what's safe. Uh, companies are often described as more lawyers than brains. Uh, I and the Cavalry has this wonderful graphic of, of the five motivations of security researchers. You know, pro you know the protectors, those who look at it as a puzzle, those who want some like sort of pride or prestige. Some people are in for the money. Uh, other people are doing it to, to make a statement, you know, some sort of protest. Uh, those are not understood by business very well. They uh, don't realize that most of those are actually fairly altruistic and, and their benefit. Um, some genu you know, some of my other research, you know, uh, these companies are genuinely naive. They don't understand the security problems and that's okay. You know, we, we do need to educate them. So many others really should know better. So let's talk about some of the problems we have with researchers. And um, like I said, I'm a recovering politician. I know all about ego and bravado. Uh, but it's a problem, right? It's, it's a real problem because this lack of transparency on where these lines are going to be if there's no VDP, vulnerability program, um, means that there's going to be times where people are unintentionally crossing lines, right? So we have to understand that there are instances where these researchers aren't going to even understand what they should look at. Um, and the poor choices and things like wording where uh, if we look at the, the Malta case where four students um, tried to report an issue and I think they put in it that they wanted to uh, see if there was a bug bounty available if they reported it and they also had this disclosure timeline, they used this type of very aggressive wording, was treated as a threat and, and, and um, received some investigation for that. Like, those are things where we look at researchers and say like, hey, this is not uh, a cooperative way to work with government, right? It's not a, it's not a cooperative way that's gonna have a policy uh, positive effect. So there's just desire for that publicity, right? It, it, it also is a problem when researchers just don't understand the laws, right? They don't understand which types of information might be radioactive in a way, right? Uh, PHI um, or other types of information. Um, and the other thing with researchers is Sometimes researchers have a lack of empathy, right? Because organizations 
are oftentimes genuinely either naive or under-resourced, right? You're talking about a security team of only maybe four or five people. I think the Alberta government one is still uh, comparable size to that. Um, and, and you're looking at an organization with thousands of employees and thousands of servers across multiple departments, right? Like, it becomes a real problem. So there's this reliance on this sort of deadline and, and an inflexible process that leaves no nuance for how can we work cooperatively with the government on, on, on improving these policies, improving these sort of um, issues, because the government is going to be forced to take a cookie cutter uh, response, right? They're going to be forced to call the lawyer because now you've emailed them this thing and the lawyer says, well, we have to report this to the police and then the police go, well, now we have to search this person's home, right? It, it, becomes, a whole, it becomes a whole issue. So some government agencies and, and businesses are getting it. Uh, May 2022, uh, DOJ announced a policy not to charge uh, good faith researchers. They'll still investigate, but the prosecutor, prosecutor discretion uh, says, yeah, you have, if somebody's doing good and you know, they're following rules and everything like that, yeah, they may have stepped on the line, but you choose not to, to prosecute. This is a good thing. Um, I was reminded uh, yesterday at B-Sides that when Keith Alexander was speaking at DEF CON, he said, you know, what do we need to do to get more, more people into the service to, to help secure everything? And somebody shouted, stop arresting researchers. Um, CISA has been doing some amazing work on this, and I've been talking in the last couple of days. I wish I could have updated the slides uh, till now. Uh, but they've got like vulnerability disclosure templates for all the federal agencies. It's like, you'll know, fill in blank, and boom, you have you know, a policy and a, a template. Uh, CERT has a, a guide to coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Uh, many uh, organizations have vulnerability disclosure programs with safe harbor carve outs saying, you know, if you report things through this method and you ad adhere to these you know, restrictions, like you know, don't go public with it until we fixed it, et cetera, you know, we, we, we promise not to prosecute you. Uh, I'm the Cavalry has done amazing work in this category. Uh, initiatives like the security.txt uh, uh, RFC, uh, this needs to be a thing where it's like a place where security researchers know they can look to, for who to report stuff to. So you don't have to have a big, you know, thing in your, your, your website, but it's like, if you know, you know where to look and, and can get the information to the people who can actually fix this stuff. Uh, Amit Elazari, I actually spoke to her yesterday. She's been doing a bunch of work on Safe Harbor, and apparently she actually knows a bunch of her, uh, the Canadian counterparts there is going to be leaning on them fairly extensively uh, to get some of the same stuff put in. So, like, yay! But yeah, like, I think this is one of those issues, right? When we talk about things like how do researchers actually work in government? And, and, and government needs to also put out that olive branch, right? We talk about things like reporting paths and security.txt, right? Um, when I was an elected official, I had direct access to many politicians and government officials, and I still didn't even know who to report to, right? I had to get the staff person to figure it out. So you need that VDP that spells out things like the rules of engagement, spells out things like who are the people you should be reporting to, what are the, what are the channels. Um, you need information on who owns what systems and, and, and where those systems uh, should receive the reports. Um, and we need to look at things like legislative changes, right? We need to ch look at changing some of the laws that are basically saying uh, all or nothing, right? If you, if you do any type of research, any type of accidental access or disclosure, um, then you're going to be prosecuted, right? The HIA has that attempt to access clause, for example, right? Like those are the types of issues where we need to start looking at what are the opportunities to make revisions that are more fitting with a modern security framework in mind. Uh, we need to work with law enforcement, right? Law enforcement needs to understand that they need to work with researchers, uh, recognize what researchers are trying to do when they have positive intent. Like, oftentimes, researchers, especially if they're helping, trying to help the government with this type of information, they're trying to disclose to the government, um, they're not asking for money, they're not asking for anything, they're trying to do free research work for you. Um, and we need to have those established procedures in place to prevent the knee-jerk reaction of, well, I got a report and I don't know what to do, so the first call is to the justice lawyer who is going to call the RCMP, right? Like, that's, or the relevant policing force, right? And, and, and that's going to be one of the most important things. Is that there must be a way for organizations and the governments and to understand that these types of reports are going to keep coming and they're going to increase in volume as more and more people are concerned about public data, right? And there's lots of ways you can do that. You can do things like canary records. You can do test systems like a CTF 
uh, style flag that's like, if you find this person's healthcare record, it's a fake record, but then we know you're actually inside, right? Um, but if you are going to do this, uh, this type of research, which I actually don't recommend, I don't think it was that enjoyable to have the RCMP seize all my things, um, but if you are going to do it, you should probably try to figure out who to call first, right? Who can you give a heads up? Um, maybe they're in a security.txt. Maybe they're in some sort of, if you look through the staff directory, you're going to find a security person, right? Uh, identify yourself and say, like, hey, I want to look at this thing, or I think this is a, a problem. They might say, don't. They might say, here's a unique header to include in all your requests, whatever, so we can identify the traffic. Um, but those are the types of conversations that are going to uh, need to be coming from government um, as they work with researchers. So th this is a really fundamental like capitalist thing of if someone is coming to you with a vulnerability report and wants to make your product better, they're doing free work for you. Let them. Right? Th this should not be hard to you know, understand. Expect that reports will come in. Again, many eyes. People will do weird stuff with your products and you know, throw weird stuff in, in you know, like emojis in various fields or whatever. And if something happens, you kind of want them to tell you. Uh, assume positive intent. You know, unless they actually say, you know, give me money or your dog dies. You know, assume that they're just like trying to make your product better. Uh, a vulnerability disclosure program does not equal a bug bounty. You don't have to pay, right? It's just having a pathway to, to ingest those, those reports. You don't have to pay out, right? That's a whole other thing. Uh, it costs next to nothing to do this. I mean, you could even just have like a kudos page, like, hey, these people have found vulnerabilities. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, hell, Pornhub for certain uh, levels of vulnerability sends out really awesome t shirts to people. You know, stick figures. It's like, oh, what are you doing? You know, looking for holes. Yeah. <laughs> Takes out a whole new meaning there. Um, vulnerability disclosure program also allows you. Uh, uh, if you're a company or a government, to establish the legal lines and the rules of engagement, so you know you can say exactly when a rule a line has been crossed. You know, you could say, "Well, please rate limit to you know five requests a minute or something, so you don't take this down." But somebody doing like five million requests, it's like, okay, that's pretty obvious. Um, helps your case too if you're you're going to law enforcement and saying, "Yeah, we're under attack." You know, it's definitely not a researcher. Um, uh, uh, OSSF, Vulnerable Disclosure Working Group, uh, has some uh, stuff if you're an open source project uh, for taking in vulnerability disclosures. Uh, outsource this stuff if you want. Uh, Hacker One, all those, those kind of companies. You don't, again, don't have to pay out a bug bounty. It's just a matter of having a, a, a way, a pathway to take these things in. Just think about the reputation damage from going after a researcher and you know trying to, to snuff them out and stop their message and everything versus like actually like fixing the problem. Being a dick is way more expensive, right? So just this is gonna happen, you know, just make sure it can easily. Researchers are part of the problem too. There's a lot of you in this room, I'm assuming. Uh, choose your targets carefully. There are some radioactive data types, like as we found health information, uh, that you just really need to be careful with. Like, uh, you know, minimize your impacts, rate limit, be reasonable, minimal proofs of concept. You know, don't go trying to grab the entire database or anything like that. You know, one record or at least just if you can go to them with like a preponderance of evidence, but never actually pulling the trigger on the exploit. You know. That, that can be enough at times, saying, like, I think this will work, but I leave it to you to execute. Uh, maybe get legal counsel on retainer. The phrase, well, talk to my lawyer, will stop a lot of awkward conversations very quickly because suddenly it's going to cost them money to talk to your lawyer, and hopefully cool heads will prevail in that time. Uh, if there's a known exploit, like there's a CV for it and a proof of concept, uh, maybe don't execute it. You know, just say, hey, uh, your server version identifies as this, there's this, this proof of concept or this exploit, uh, preponderance of evidence. Uh, saves you from like accidentally running something and going like maybe further than you thought it would. Uh, watch your language. No threats or demands of any type. Like, don't, you know, uh, uh, 
don't ask if you can get a free t-shirt or something like that. It's, it's anything that could be like blackmail or extortion. Just no, it's like here, I'm giving you everything. So I have no leverage at all. If you choose to give me something great, but I'm not going to ask for anything. Document the hell out of everything. Uh, expect that you'll wind up in court someday and you have to show this to a judge or, or you know, other lawyers or prosecutors. You want to have all your ducks in a row on that one. Uh, be very formal in your communication. Uh, it may become public. Uh, I did a bunch of freedom of information requests for stuff in my case. And looking back, yeah, some of my communications were like, okay, yeah, I should not have said it that way. That was a bad idea. Uh, keep your ego in check. If somebody just doesn't want to hear from you, it's like, okay, you, you tried. It, it's all on them now. Uh, pick your battles. But consider this whole talk sort of a call to arms to advocate at all levels, you know, federal, uh, state or provincial, hell, municipal uh, governments, as well as like at your own companies, you know, big or small, a security text, you know, file costs you nothing to put in place. Uh, because we've got bigger problems to solve, let's, let's not go arresting the researchers and everything like that that are actually trying to help. Again, free labor. So, I think we're gonna skip this one, actually, because we just kind of sum up everything. But, anyways, so to our stories, there's this rather wonderful epilogue. So, like we said, all the things eventually got resolved, right? They added that secure QR code, they added the CAPTCHA, a couple controls. Um, Alberta now has that uh, a cybersecurity community of interest where people can voice concerns, engage with the GOA. Um, and all these things. They have a sort of a reporting method now. There's a web, there's a web portal anyways. It still needs a bit of work. Um, but we are working with some politicians in Alberta, some of my former colleagues, to see about having some of these changes brought in legislatively. Um, and we're hoping to continue engaging, as, as Render was saying, with some law enforcement agencies and all those types of things uh, to bring about more federal uh, changes. So since 2018, uh, I scared them enough to open up their wallets. Uh, the threat intel team was massively shaken up uh, and reorganized because apparently they missed a bunch of things. Um, huge reorganization in the IT department, uh, to, uh, including providing uh, teams to departments that maybe didn't have the budget or the resources to fix things. And while they couldn't be told that they needed to, to fix things because they had their own policies, they're like, Here's a bunch of people who work for you for free uh, to fix this because it's all in our best interests. And, and I have to say, it took them about a year, but they really got their crap together. Uh, uh, it's way better than it is. Occasionally, I'll, I'll throw a report at them for, for something, but it's not the embarrassment that it was uh, uh, previously. Um, in that uh, subsequent time, I connected with Thomas uh, when things hit the fan for him. You know, wrote a letter to the editor basically saying, you know, yeah, okay, he violated the uh, letter of the law, but the law is stupid, and by, you know, if you prosecute him, then there's this chilling effect that nobody else is going to want to speak up and point out, you know, the emperor has no clothes. Uh, wrote a letter to the court, which was really weird. Um, it's like, really, your court's going to listen to me and my opinions? Like, do they know me? Um, and while he was an MLA, because he had stepped down from caucus, he was still an elected member. He just wasn't part of any party at that point. Uh, he was still a sitting member of our uh, legislature. And he saw the opportunity for a glorious bit of trolling. So for those of you not in a Commonwealth country, um, the Queen Elizabeth II's Platinum Jubilee was uh, last, year, last year, which is 70 years of being the monarch in Canada. So all the provinces and, and the federal government commissioned these awards for citizens. In Alberta, 7,000 were made. A bunch of people got them automatically, MLAs, mayors, you know, those types of um, egotistical people. Um, but MLAs got this opportunity uh, as electeds to nominate citizens for exemplary acts of service to the province. I, I think you might be able to see where this is going. So why don't we nominate somebody who found and report a bunch of vulnerabilities to the Alberta government in 2018-19? They gave me a fucking medal. Uh, I, I will point out, Render originally thought the email from my office was spam. Well, 
it, it was like, hey, you've been nominated for an award. Please give us all this personal information. I, I only asked for like birthday, social security number, you know, all the normal things you need to give out an award. Um, but the same government that didn't need render services anymore uh, was going to honor him with this distinguished medal. Uh, and then you can see how he dressed. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a, a Joker inspired suit, by the way. Um, and we had the opportunity to, uh, I, I had a certain number of guests that I could invite. And uh, Thomas was kind enough to put on letterhead, all official, uh, a invitation to the CISO of Service Alberta who had called the cops on me as one of my invited guests to the ceremony. He was unfortunately uh, in Vancouver uh, giving a speech, uh, but uh, he couldn't attend, but he, he appreciated you know, the, the, the whole humor in this and, and everything, the irony. Uh, Evil Mog, the uh, church of Wi-Fi's uh, bishop, a uh, friend of mine, uh, was also given an award in this too, so two of us have this service award. Uh, but yeah, since medals are being given out quite generously, uh, yeah. we figured we should continue to do so. Yeah. So we have the, the Church of Wi-Fi DEF CON Medal of Service, uh, awarded to those who are providing service to others in the community. Uh, I made these on uh, my CNC at home. Um, they are janky as hell, but uh, made about 220 of them, and we'll be handing these out through the week uh, weekend to those we see doing cool things. So if you got a really cool project, or you're like teaching a bunch of people things in the hallway, or like you buy us a lot of drinks or something too, you know, we'll we'll, we'll give you one of these. Don't so. buy the drinks all at the same time. Oh God, 200 is too much. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so the, the outline ones are, are new service, uh, the solid ones are going to people who've uh, uh, done me uh, uh, solids in the past or like people who really are the ones that pull off DEF CON like Nikita, um, you know, they're going to get those, so. Wow, five minutes left. Uh, I guess questions? So, well. I, I, I think, Thomas, um, you, you should get the first one of these for uh, ex excellence in trolling and uh, excellence in service to my ego. So, there you go. No questions? I, I think being the troll, sorry, I think being the troll was why Render knew I belonged to coming to a DEF CON, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, Pat. Yeah, he's saying that as a researcher, the thing that will have the least risk to you is to do nothing. Problem is, I have unfortunately burdened with a conscience. So I, I see something like that, and it's like, I, I, I had to try. Yeah, the, the second least uh, uh, risky thing is to drop it on pace bin or something like that. And I'm like, yeah, but again, it's the will it ever actually reach I, them. I, I think the one thing to think about, though, when you say that is, especially when you're talking about government organizations, that's not necessarily the least risky thing because your information is in that system, right? Like, so that's a real issue for you and your friends and your family. Yeah, you, you, I, I'm protecting my own ass, and I, I like my ass, so. Yeah, just basically pointing out to the government that uh, making it so that they, that we could come to them uh, with a, a report is better than the other two options. And like, you're quite right, so. There it is. Oh. As someone from the Midwest, specifically Missouri, I'm legally obligated to shit on Missouri at all times. So I must inform you that it is not Mississippi, it is Missouri in that case. So he's correcting me on which state that was uh, the case of. I mean, you guys have got way too many of them, and so many of them begin with M, so I'm Canadian, so I'm just gonna like claim ignorance or something here. So. I mean, keeping track of batshit insane states is like a full-time job, so. There you go, one more, time for one more, let me go here.
Mm. So, so do we think there's something that can be done to incentivize people who are in management or higher levels uh, to bring in VDPs and things like that? I, I, I think that a big piece of it's going to be the legislation piece, right? Talking them saying like, hey, you need to have these systems in place. You need to have the policies in place that are going to allow this disclosure. Yeah, and if law enforcement you know, steps in and says, well, if you have a way for people to report this stuff, uh, anybody who doesn't, it's much more obvious their, their malicious intent actually might make prosecution easier in certain cases. Um, but also, I mean, never underestimate a barbed wire covered bat. You know, like just browbeat them into doing it because uh, uh, it's in their best interest to debt free labor. Like, we need thousands of security experts. Well, there's people lined up to do work for you for free. Let them. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.